Hello everyone and welcome to this session. I'm Clifton and I'm joined by my colleagues Friedrich and Gert. And together we are the Belgian Power Apps and Flow user group. We started this group in 2018 and we have grown to approximately 250 plus members, more or less. Uh, our main goal is promoting the adoption of the Microsoft Power Platform. We are focused on the non-BI components of the Microsoft Power Platform and their interaction with the surrounding ecosystem. We organize events throughout the whole year. Sometimes we do it alone, and sometimes we work closely with other user groups and associations. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us, please feel free to take a look at our website. Uh, before we continue, uh, it would be good if I introduce our next speaker. So, uh, uh, our next speaker is all the way from, uh, I think, Poland, if I'm correct. <laughs> but uh, let's, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. So let's now uh, uh, switch over to Ivan uh, to introduce himself and show what he's got in store for us today. So if we switch over here, then it should go smoothly. Uh, so Ivan, you go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to share my screen. So I have only one. Here it go. Do you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. We can Perfect. see your screen and we can see your PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, let's start then. Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope you're ready to learn some stuff about PCF. Uh, today we will talk about some tips and tricks all around the PCF uh, development. I hope there are some developers uh, around so they can pick up, but if you're a consultant, you can also pick some things up from this uh, presentation and tell your developers how they can make their life easier while developing the PCF components. Okay, so first things first. So who am I request? I am Ivan. I'm coming all uh, down from uh, Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, I am a software developer in dynamic space for uh, like five years now. I'm working in the biggest consultancy, Microsoft consultancy uh, in Croatia called Span, and I've been Microsoft MVP from yesterday twice. So I've been awarded uh, Microsoft MVP twice from yesterday. If you want to contact me, you can uh, do it like uh, on all social networks. Here are some of them, so LinkedIn and Twitter, they are the most active ones, or uh, via my blogs, if you want to read my articles and stuff, or just ask a question, go for it and feel free to reach me out. Okay, so let's start with those top 10 tips and tricks. Uh, I will start with like tooling and end like uh, with develop, uh, development, testing, debugging, and uh, regular tips and tricks around development. So first thing is tooling. Uh, if you are in a PCF development world, you already know that you need to have uh, modern web developer tools for you to build uh, the actual components. So the required stuff are Node.js plus NPM, and of course, uh, for building the components, uh, you need to have .NET Framework version uh, 4.6.2 uh, or plus. Okay, and of course, you have a um, dozen of IDEs that you can use, but the most common ones are Visual Studio Code and the Big Brother, the full Visual Studio version, but in this case, I prefer using Visual Studio Code because uh, it's much more friendly for the uh, web development, modern web development. You have everything in it and you can uh, do cool things uh, with it with all the plugins out there. OK, but those are the tools that you really need to have. But there are also tools made by community that will make your life easier. So let's start with some. 
first of all, the first one that came out was, was by Danish uh, called PCF Builder for XRM Toolbox. So it's a XRM Toolbox tool that is uh, friendly for the very beginners in the PCF development. You can uh, execute all the commands visually, just click around like you would normally do in uh, some other graphical UIs, execute the controls and it will make your uh, life much easier in that development when you are starting. Maybe when you are more experienced, you will know the commands, you will be faster or I don't know, you maybe prefer command line, but here's the tool that I think is the most suitable for uh, the guys that are just starting the PCF development. Uh, Danish came with a great idea to build uh, the Visual Studio extension that does most of the things uh, as the PCF builder for XRM toolbox, but is fully integrated inside the Visual Studio code. So you don't need to uh, know the syntax. You just uh, press Control Shift P, uh, type PCF, and you will see all the commands that you can execute uh, directly from your Visual Studio code. And it will prompt you uh, for all the data that is needed to, I don't know, build a solution, create a solution project, initialize uh, the solution and stuff like that. And it's really friendly because uh, as you can see on the GIF on the right, it will just prompt you for uh, some uh, values. You just input the values and go with the flow your solution will be initialized, you will uh, build your solution, you will create a solution project and so on so and so on. And the third one is now a PCF generator that is a command line tool that allows you to initialize uh, the PCF project all at once. So it will uh, initialize the project like the PCF builders uh, init command. So it's in the background uh, Power App CLI that initia uh, initiates the initialization. But it also adds uh, the CSS samples, the preview image, uh, the ResX files for translation. Uh, now we're working on the build. Uh, build actions for GitHub so you can easily uh, import the GitHub actions workflow to your project and so on and so on. And uh, by answering simple questions by the Yeoman, you can uh, actually initialize everything. And when you build the component, you actually have the working component that you can upload to your uh, environment and check if it is working. Uh, it's still in development. It has few features, but a cool thing about it is because I uh, collaborated with Danish with PCF Builder for Visual Studio Code and from uh, last week or so you can uh, easily execute uh, Yeoman commands, so PCF generator commands directly from Visual Studio inside uh, the plugin, PCF Builder plugin for Visual Studio Code. It's simply amazing. I think that now all the tools are working together to achieve the main goal to uh, make our life easier while developing the uh, controls. OK, that's for the tools. But when we are creating the tools, we want to make it intuitive. When we initialize our uh, controls, uh, we uh, have sorry, we have uh, some metadata that we need to input in our manifest file. So that manifest file is a file that will describe your component and what your component can actually do. Uh, when you uh, initialize the repository, it is like blank. It has some placeholders that you need to replace, and uh, you need to replace them with the actual values to describe your component. Uh, you need to explain to the user how to use it. Uh, spend some time on your manifest file because at the end it will uh, help your users uh, to adopt the actual control. If they don't know how to use it, they will not use it. 
the two most important things are control and property uh, nodes in the manifest. You need to input all the descriptions that are there out to you for uh, type in because you need to make the user know what does that property do? What does the control do in general? So please populate all the values that you need. If you have complex controls that have, for example, uh, JSON configurations or stuff like that, it, you need to write a documentation. So most of the controls are uh, available on GitHub and uh, they have a documentation there. If you have a complex control, please, uh, type some documentation, you make uh, life easier for your users now, not for yourself, but for your users, because it will uh, make the adoption a lot more easier for you. Uh, describe what's really important. That's the interesting part, because I saw some components and controls that have a descriptions that are too long. People don't want to read those descriptions. Keep it easy less characters but more info so uh go straight to the point what what do you want that your users uh want to see on the actual controls for example on the right we see the control that we want to build so uh we have sorry here here it is oh okay so uh, we have the fancy text control and uh, that's a name of control. Please don't don't uh, let the uh, placeholder text uh, is sitting here when you release the component because that's immature. You need to make uh, the name of your control easily readable. Also goes for the description that is control that makes your text red. This is where you explain your component. And uh, with field properties, uh, there is a text value, okay? So here uh, on the bottom, it says the text value. Okay, we will have some text value, of course. It's a single line of text, as you can see there. And the description is pretty easy value of the text field. You, you don't need to explain that kind of info uh, anymore, but you have some complex things. Okay, JSON configuration for, I don't know, alert messages that will pop up. and. But of course, then you need to make uh, documentation for it to make uh, the users understand how to actually use it. The next thing is preview image. Uh, the initial uh, CLI tool is not including uh, the preview image to your controls. It is shown on the left and it's a big no-no please don't do it because you want to make your uh, to make your control more attractive by putting some preview images that will um, appeal your user so i want to use this component or oh, wow this component is doing really the thing that I, I want so please add a preview image it's really easy and i will show you how on the next slide okay so people are mostly visual types I don't know people that don't like the images, that don't like to visualize the stuff. So you want to make users to see what uh, the control is uh, doing. The big point here is the dimensions. The dimensions are shown in the slides, so 117 and 130 pixels. And that's important because on the right, you see that uh, the image is 100 by 100 and it's stretched to the actual values of um, uh, uh, shown uh, on the left. So the requirements are there. You need to make uh, the um, images friendly to that ratio. So you just keep the ratio 17 by 13 and you're good to go. Your image will not be stretched around uh that's really important because maybe uh, some key parts will be like modified and you don't want to uh, show them as that modified versions so use the exact 17 by 13 ratio when creating an, a preview image it's really easy to add a preview image you can uh, do it by just uh, typing in preview image and path to your preview image in the manifest file in control mode 
how easy is that? I know it's shown in documentation, but like 90% of the uh, controls nowadays don't have the preview images. Uh, no need for the research node. You know that when you want to use images inside your control, you need to add them as the resource at the bottom of your manifest. It's not a case with a preview image because you already uh, add, added that image to the control node and you don't need to uh, do it for the research node. I know that uh, controls were crashing in the past when you added a, a preview image and imported that controls to the canvas apps. I know it was uh, it was in the tra release train that was fixing that, but I'm not sure if uh, it's available on uh, all regions. Uh, Maybe it is. Uh, I'm not developing uh, lately Canvas app control, so I can't tell you that, but in model driven apps, it's working like a charm at a moment. OK, and now the localization. What about localization? So people are, uh, some people in the world uh, want to use uh, the systems, the applications on their languages. I'm not a fan of uh, applications in creation, for example, but I know the people that all around the world are uh, likely to use uh, the applications in their language. So there is a possibility for you in uh, the framework to make the localization for them. But how can you make the localization in those kind of frameworks? There's files called ResX files. They're used for translations. And uh, with that ResX files, they're also language code IDs. So you need to have a ResX file and corresponding uh, language code ID, so LCID here. And with that combination, you will uh, target the language with your uh, translation file. But how can you know all the values for those language code IDs? Yeah, as you can see for English, it's 1033 or 1040 for Italian. How can I know all the uh, codes by myself? Do I need to remember it or what do I do here? Uh, actually, there are dozens of places around the web that, uh, that can make you find the actual values, but I can show you how you can easily include the ResX files to your project. Now, some things uh, about the ResX files and localization in general. Uh, think about users on the first place. You want to translate uh, the actual components. Uh, there are two levels of the translations. One is the configuration level that is only available when you're configuring the component. And the key part here is you have only one language for the configuration. So only the base language for the environment is the configuration language. That you must keep that in mind. So if you created a Belgium uh, environment, you can't make configurations in English. So you must target the Belgium ResX files for your uh, configuration level uh, translations. The other level is control UI. That is a personal setting. You can change the language uh, in your personal settings and it will just pop up in the UI of the user. So uh, for example, if we have English and Belgium, in our uh, ResX files, we can just uh, swap around from English to Belgium back and forth and see that our language, uh, that UI is changing by, based on the language, if we define it right. So the language code IDs, I said before, they're like numbers that define the language. You can find them all, uh, all around uh, the web, but uh, actually, you can easily uh, create a ResX files via community tools. Uh, for example, PCF Builder has uh, a function that will just pop out the uh, language list. You pick the language and boom, you will have uh, the ResX file added to your manifest, added uh, to your strings files, and you're good to go. 
uh, if you think you had and uh, include at least one translation file, for example, an English translation file, it will be much, much easier in the future to include more languages. You just need to add uh, Resix uh, file for that language, populate all the values inside that XML. Keys will be the same. You just need to change the values. After you change the values, you, you will be ready to go and boom, you have a new language for your control. Now, I think I will just go to the demo part real quick just to show you the things I was talking about. OK, so Visual Studio Code. OK, I, ha I think that the zoom level is good. Uh, just confirm on the other side. Do you see the XML clearly or, or do I need to zoom a bit more? OK, I will. I hope that Simon will I silence. Can clearly. I can uh, okay, see clearly. Okay, I do okay. not have a response from the audience, so uh, it should be OK. OK, so the first thing that you need to edit when you are uh, creating a PCF control is the manifest file. So located in the root folder of the control manifest file. And the first thing you need to change is control node. So in control node, you have two parameters display name. Oh, sorry, display name and this uh, description key. OK, display name key and description key. You can type the string values here, but uh, we talked about translations, so you uh, can start with already with translation file and uh, start editing there. So we have a key value here, so not an actual string, just a key value. And where can we find that key? If we go to the strings files where we store our translation ResX files, we can go to uh, English translation. So 1033 is for English. Scroll down and at the very bottom we see control display name key. If we uh, look here, it just the same, it's just the same key, OK? And now we have a value node where we type the value that we want to translate. So here is the fancy text control for our control, uh, control name, OK? And now we jump to the Resix for creation. I created the same thing for creation, and we have the same key here, and the translation for the actual value uh, from English to the creation. And by that, we can easily translate our uh, configuration. So you can uh, edit display name key, description key. Also, you have in the property part, so in the property node, also display name and description key. You just translate it the same way. You just go property, display name, the, the, and description, and it will be translated. Just easy as that. You just add it here, and it will be translated on the configuration level. If you want to uh, translate your control on the UI level, uh, you have the ability from the framework. So the main part uh, of our control is index.ts, and I created a simple control that is a simple input that will just make your uh, text inside that text box red. Just to show you the example how to do it. So uh, let's see this line. So placeholder text. There is a API call from the context node, then uh, resources and get string. That basically means as you can see, get localized string version uh, of the given identifier. And how is that so? So we have text input placeholder. We need to include that note in our ResX file to add the translation. If you see, we have this note here and we have a value type something in red. Fine, perfect. And we have the same note in creation. OK, plus value. If we deploy the control that way, we can uh, just switch real quick to the actual controls. We don't need that, we don't need that. Okay, so here's our simple control. So if we type test, we see that the, the text is in red, but 
the key part is here. Type something in red color. That's the placeholder text. And now I'm using the application in English. I can switch uh, the personalization settings back to Croatian that I'm not using actually uh, on a daily basis, but so what's wrong? The configuration is not popping. Maybe because my machine is slow. Just let's do a really quick refresh and see what's happening then. OK, refresh. OK, personalization settings again. Ah, of course. Oh, here we go. English, change the creation. OK, now when the page refreshes, we'll see the creation value for the placeholder text. And it's done only by a one line of code. OK, so this is something in creation. OK, it says the same thing as in English. Uh, that way, with a just single line of code in our uh, TypeScript, we can get the values from our ResX files based on the language of the user interface itself. So that's really gr a great thing. I was talking about preview images too. So preview image, you see the control node is here. So the control node, if we scroll all the way to the right, we see the preview image uh, attribute that it's showing image preview PNG. OK, where is that? So we have a, a image PNG here in our image folder, image PNG. If we open, it's a simple image that I created for my Yeoman generator CLI tool. So uh, basically it will show as image as you uh, saw on the slides when you're configuring your controls. So it will show just like, where is that preview image here? Somewhere here. Okay, so here you see that image will be shown there. That's an easy part. So I've done preview images, localization, and intuitive ways. So I will now show you real quick the tools. If you open the XRM toolbox, you can search for PCF Builder, and here is the latest version of PCF Builder. You can execute all the controls that you want. So build, open test harness, increment version, create a solution, all the things you want with a simple click of a button and boom, you have your command up and running. OK, that's the first tool, but I was talking about Visual Studio extension too. If you in Visual Studio code, if you install the plugin from the marketplace, you just go control shift P and the command line will pop up. So you just go PCF builder, OK? And you will see all the commands that you um, want to execute. For example, I want to add a new ResX file uh, to my component. OK, I want to, for example, Albanian. I don't know why I choose that, but that's just an example. And now the add-on crashed. <laughs> but you can easily do it uh, that way. I don't know why it crashed. Uh, maybe we can show it here. OK, so it's basically Yeoman generator in the background, and that's the third tool I was talking about. CLI tool that will guide you through the uh, whole project creation. So first of all, you just go Yo PCF, and it will pop up the wizard for you. So control namespace is fits. OK, control name is super control. OK, I want to make a field control. Fine. I want to include React plus Fluent UI frameworks here. Yeah, do it for me. OK, publisher prefix for my solution will be OK fits and the publisher name will be my name. When I uh, populate all the fields from the wizard, the uh, project initialization would start and and it will just pop you with a few more questions. Do you want to overwrite all the files? Yeah, okay. And now it 
uh, creates few files for you, initialize the project, initiates npm install, so it is uh, pulling all the dependencies for you. It is initiating uh, ms build command for the initial build. So you don't need to know all the commands around to use the tool. It will just uh, create ev everything for you in the background and you will have the complete project ready to start developing. So you don't lose the time for initialization. You just develop the things that you want. So I will just stop this because I don't want it to finish. And that's all for the demo part for now. Let's switch back to the presentation. OK, I was here. Yeah, I have so. Uh, there's some uh, usual libraries uh, that are used with the PCF development. First of all, React and Office Fabric UI. Lately, uh, the Office Fabric UI was uh, having a big makeover and uh, it is now replaced with Fluent UI. It is almost the complete parity with the previous one and it has few more features and it will uh, in future it will be developed as a fluent UI. So if you are uh, reading about Office Fabric UI, it's basically fluent UI now. OK, but why are we using React and Fabric UI at all? Most of you guys, when you start to play around with PCF, you're playing with uh, the plain JavaScript uh, version. So just the TypeScript. TypeScript without any other uh, frameworks out there, but there are cool frameworks and they're used by Microsoft too. While while they're uh, creating their components, first party components for us. So why would you use React? There is a cool feature called Virtual DOM. Virtual DOM is basically uh, the DOM that is not generated whole every time we make the change. Uh, virtual DOM is like a smart DOM that will just regenerate the part of the DOM that is uh, being changed. You you don't need to re-render whole DOM every time you make the change to your variables uh, or components. In future, we expect to have virtual controls. Nowadays, we need to pack React to every single component. So one React version per component. And if you want to load few components with the React, you will actually load React times how many components are using React, and that will destroy your forms. Learning React is a good thing to do because Microsoft is using it. We will eventually have virtual controls available, and it's a win win situation. You will learn a new technology and it will be used in uh, Microsoft uh, Microsoft stack in future, for example, in the whole um, model driven on Canvas development. You get uh, Power Apps look and feel with the Office Fabric UI, uh, UI framework. Uh, on the right, you see the controls that you have with that uh, UI framework. So for example, date pickers, buttons, uh, drop downs, sliders, checkboxes, all that is included in a flu uh, fluent UI or fabric UI for you, uh, and you can use it as is. You just need to do at a moment slightly CSS changes, so you need to change and tweak the styles to match it uh, for the model driven or canvas app. But in the future, I saw few components had change their style uh, to uh, the original style from the Fabric UI. So we can expect in future that we'll get more and more components uh, that are just the same as the Fabric UI in our model driven apps uh, at the first place. Uh, there are pre-built controls. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm not a fan of reinventing the wheel. Whenever you can, you just use the things that are available in the community, uh, put it in and just play with the 
interesting part. So developing not the style uh, styling of the components. If I need a drop down, uh, I want to that drop down to look like uh, any other drop down in my application, and I just use Office UI Fabric one, and boom, I have the drop down that I want in my uh, component. Uh, so transition to Fluent UI, you just want to update your references to target the new Fluent UI. In that case, you will get all the new updates to the framework itself. Nowadays, it, uh, there are two versions and they have, they're updated in parallel, but at the end of the road, only Fluent UI will exist and you want to transition fully to Fluent UI. When we are talking about libraries, those were two main libraries that we want to use in our uh, controls, but there are also dozens of third party libraries all around uh, the web. So don't reinvent the guild, uh, wheel again because somebody already wrote something that you wanted to make. If there is something that you can use, please use it. Uh, most of the developers from uh, that are coming from the dynamic space are not that familiar with the front-end tools. So basically front-end tool uh, that is same as NuGet packages is NPM packages in the front-end development. So uh, they're more or less the same thing. So they are pulling the dependencies from the uh, web for you and installing uh, uh, them to your project. NPM is really your friend. Uh, overloading is bad. Uh, don't overload your simple components with the tons of code that you will don't uh, will not use. I saw some components installing uh, NuGet packages. Uh, sorry, NuGet uh, NPM packages all around, but they don't use it in the actual code. It will just uh, tell the Webpack to. Uh, include all the those packages in your bundle file and it's not good if you're not using the dependency just uninstall it by and uh, by uh, typing npm uninstall and think about the size of your project too because it can uh, get pretty big if you install all the libraries out there use it wisely because it's like a kind of surprise you don't know what you will get with it. Uh, it is a funny story. Uh, today uh, I had a really great discussion with Scott Duro and Danish about one uh, guy from the community that uh, included um, a control available on the PCF gallery and uh, it's using font awesome. Uh, it's a UI library that uh, makes uh, some crazy fonts, uh, uh, shiny icons and stuff like that, and you can easily use it. But actually, when you included the JavaScript from that font awesome library, uh, since we are not uh, anymore in the sandbox, in the iframe sandbox, we are affecting the whole application. So. Uh, imagine the model driven app that has a component that ambitious component on, on the form and it will just make your UI uh, unrecognizable because that font are awesome uh, made some serious changes to the actual DOM of our application and since we are now in a single page application world in the model driven apps if you change the pages, uh, so you go for, uh, from one form to another, to another view, it will just stay there. If you will not get rid of it just uh, by going to another page. If you reload, it will just feel, the fine, uh, feel just fine, but if you j jump back to the actual ambitious form, it will again go crazy and that's really a bad idea. So I hope in future we will get some blacklist of the libraries that should not be used in uh, the PCF because some libraries can uh, do really bad things to you. So use it wisely. Know what, what you are using. If, you're, if you see that ambitious stuff happening all around your application, 
just try to remove uh, library by library and see wh what's uh, causing the problem and just don't use it. And I really hope that we'll get some blacklisted libraries on the documentation page. I hope Greg is listening to this and we can uh, talk about it later. OK, so seventh tip is framework APIs. Uh, why is something not working out of the box? People uh, keep asking me stuff. For example, I created a simple text box control and uh, when I lock the form, when the form is read only, why is my control not read only? Because you didn't make it read only. That's the main part. So you need to know what the framework is capable of and what information can you get from the actual framework. For example, read only, you can easily get uh, read only flags uh, by searching in uh, mode node and uh, is control disabled property and you will get true or false if it is disabled or not. The same goes with the field level security. The field level security uh, can um, be stored in parameters, so you choose which parameter, so our text value, security and readable. If it's readable, you should just leave it as it is. If it's not readable, you need to mask the input, but you need to do it by yourself on the text input. It will just not magically mask the input for you or lock, uh, lock the input for you. The tricky part is for the complex controls and the end for those controls is overlay. So you have a huge component uh, with several fields on it, maybe some buttons and stuff, and you want to lock it when that field that is bound to your control is locked. The main, the main field, because you can only get the read only for the main bound, bound field. Uh, so the overlay is the answer. You make an overlay over your control and you just show the overlay if your control is in disabled mode. And we come uh, to the part with, yeah, you need to explore the API. If you don't explore the API, you will not know that there are some things that will make your life easier. For example, you can easily get user settings. You don't need to, for example, code the decimal separator by yourself. You can, okay, for this user, I can get decimal separator for the uh, decimal numbers. Oh, is it comma or dot? You can easily get that by framework with a few dot dot notations and uh, get the value for you. OK, that was for the framework APIs. And now the, the most interesting part here is the debugging, I think. So the debugging, there is a debugging harness that you can uh, open via command line tool and you can test your uh, control before the deployment there. But there are few difficulties that you face when you are debugging the control there. So you just can't completely test your control in the uh, test harness. For example, web API calls or I don't know, uh, some other values that are not populated correctly here or you want to real data to pull in to uh, see how it's uh, doing on the real data, you just need to push it on the organization to see it. But that pushing to the organization with every change you made is really time consuming and it could take ages. So there must be a more efficient way how to do it. If you, for example, uh, want to test um, async methods, uh, you can't uh, easily see the async await structure there. Uh, if you're using async await patterns, uh, you need to compile it back to TypeScript and uh, see what's going there. And as I said before, if you need to use Web API, you can't use Web API in the testing harness. You can just mock the data, but you really want to make yourself uh, easier and test the real API, uh, API calls. So the debug, 
there is always a better way to debug things. That, that, that's a fact. Uh, as I said, a complex control, so you, it's impossible to debug in harness because you need all the things from the real world to test it. You, you can mock the things, but that's not the best way. You, you just need to deploy it on the system and see how it's uh, doing there. Time consuming imports, you need to save time. You don't want to spend uh, your time waiting for the imports or to the organization. The answer is Fiddler's autoresponder. Uh, maybe it's a hard start for someone that never used Fiddler before, but it's a huge productivity boost for everyone. Uh, you don't need to mock anything uh, from uh, then. You just uh, uh, let's say inject the local file to uh, your browser when it's calling the actual file on the server. So you will always have the freshest uh, version of your JavaScript file from your local machine loading uh, in the browser. You can use source maps to debug the original files. If you uh, packed your controls, published the, the controls to the environments, uh, you, you saw that there is only one JavaScript file. That is, if you build it in production mode, it's minimized. It's hard to read. If you have like um, AC convoy patterns, it's almost unreadable with the default settings. So we want to use a source map and source map is uh, let me say it in that words that it's translated uh, file that translates your that minified version of the file to the actual uh, TypeScript file that you have on your local machine. Basically, if you set a breakpoint in your TypeScript file, it will fire that breakpoint while you are debugging the JavaScript files uh, on the server. And let's see how it's uh, how you can set it up and easily debug through your original TypeScript files in your organization. Okay, let me open the project once again. Okay, so first thing you need to do is go to the config.json and add this little one here. So source map equals true. It, this basically means generate source map file for me and what is source map file so if we go to the out controls and our control we can see the bundle js that is familiar for everybody uh, because it was here before but when you add this uh, true here you get bundle js map if you try to read it it's basically the source file your uh, TypeScript file in a minified version. So basically the same uh, size as your TypeScript files locally, but it's minified in one line, but it's the original TypeScript file here. Okay, and now we have a bundle JS map, but the problem is when we pack our control with MS build, it will not pack bundle JS dot map file for us. And we need to specify in our web pack that we will use source uh, source maps in our debugging sessions in as our dev tools. So in uh, your root control node, you go to not modules, search for PCF scripts folder. OK, so PCF scripts and then all the way down to web, webconfig.js, open that, and in the object config, add dev tool equals source map. You can also play, I don't want source map on dev environment, I want it only in production or vice versa, I don't know what you wanna do, but here in example, I'm uh, specifying, I want to use source map uh, anytime, okay? And with those two uh, options, you are ready to go to use source maps. And uh, how can we use source maps with the fiddler? So you pushed your, you packed your control, you pushed it on the environment, and now you can open the environment. Okay, here is your control, open developer tools, and you think that now we have the source maps, we can use the TypeScript 
but no, if we search for, okay, open file, it was text box helper. I don't see any text box helper here. And if I go here and go in my files, I can see that I have text box helper TS and I want to debug that file. So I want to set breakpoint in the line three here. And how can I do that? So I first need to open out a fiddler. Fiddler is the tool that you can download. It's free. And one part of the fiddler is the autoresponder feature. That is the main part here. So here's the autoresponder on the right. So you go type autoresponder and add a new rule. And here's the rule we want to make. So we want to inject bundle JS map when uh, bundle JS map to our uh, environment in browser because bundle JS map is not there, but our code knows how to use it. But we didn't pack it with Webpack because you don't want to exp uh, expose your source code in the production environment because you basically have two versions of code, one minified and one in source map. You don't want to do that. So you just inject that, that one here. So bundle JS, let me just, you go to any pro, uh, sorry. You just want to bind it to the process to, to avoid any conflicts out there. So just drop it here and it's now bound to only our browser. And after you created that rule, so every time uh, the browser seeks for bundle.js.map, return this file. Easy as that, you just tick it here and you're ready to go. Okay, but when you do that, you actually need to refresh the cache to get your local version, because if you don't do it, you will not get uh, the local version, you will get a cached version. So every time you check the autoresponder, make sure you refresh the cache for your browser just to pick up uh, the local files. Okay, now when our application is loaded, we will see that we have the source map here. Okay, I see that it's here, but let me show you how you can find it. Okay, open file. So text box help, helper. Now we see it here. Okay, click. Oh, yeah, that, that's our text box helper. Reveal in the sidebar. We'll open it here. So on the left, now you see that you have uh, the actual TS files here. You can set the um, breakpoints anywhere here and test it. So for example, I want to break it here, refresh uh, the browser because uh, it's called in init method and I need to refresh it to initialize the component again. And when the refresh is over, we can see that we are actually debugging in our TypeScript file. So now we can go, oh, here's the text box and we can just debug through the uh, TypeScript file as we should uh, in our development because it's much easier. You are much more familiar with TypeScript than minified JavaScript. And that way you can easily download, uh, download, sorry, debug your controls. Uh, if you make the changes in uh, the Visual Studio code, save it, refresh it, and you will uh, have the changes straight away in your uh, browser. That's really cool and uh, I encourage you to use it because it will speed up your development really a lot. Okay, just unpause that and we will go back to the presentation part. We have a few more minutes. Okay, debugging, we said that. So now the part we want to talk is performance. The performance part is uh, really important. You need to use production build when you're building your components for your production environments. You can initialize uh, the MS build for the release configuration by typing MS build configuration equals release command and it will minify your JavaScript. You will save 
the file storage. So your file will be a lot smaller. It will not include full uh, version of the files that you are using. For example, the npm uh, install uh, modules. So if you install modules, they will also be minified and stuff like that. So it will drastically improve the uh, size of your uh, component and the size will be really small. So please, if you're uh, building your components for the production use, use the uh, release build configuration. Now we have um, some discussions be, uh, between building micro components, a really huge component. So micro components are components with a simple logic, for example, a simple text field that are used multiple times uh, on the form. And the question is, should we use frameworks in this components? If the control is really basic, uh, you should not use any framework, for example, React or Fabric UI, because if I want to load 10 components, so 10 controls in one form that are using React, we will uh, pull 10 versions of the same version of React to the form and imagine uh, the load time of that form. It will destroy the load time if we use that controls uh, multiple times in the form. So think about if I have always the for example five fields that will be used on the form and i created micro components that need to have a really complex logic and i want to use frameworks that's always the case i want to build a huge component that consists of those five fields so i implement my com a complex logic by using all the frameworks in the world i need uh, make it like a single page application. Uh, and uh, in that way, you will just pull one version of React and Office Fabric, and the load time will uh, skyrocket in the terms, in terms of performance. If you're uh, building that kind of controls, you need to draw a box around your controls. Can I make that box bigger? If I can, make it bigger include few fields, few tag boxes, buttons or stuff like that in one component and build it as a single component and uh, improve your load times uh, of the application pages. That's for the performance part the most. The last one is don't hack. And I know that people, the developers in general, uh, general like to hack around the framework. That, that that's the case and we are just uh, that kind of people. Please at least try not to do it. I know that there are situations with, when I can't um, achieve something, then I need to hack, of course. Yeah, think twice before you do it because unsupported things are bad. Uh, Microsoft is suggesting you to not to uh, use unsupported but uh, people still use it. Things will eventually break. The unsupported things are there because they didn't want to expose it. For example, you can uh, use web API, web API execute, but it's not exposed in the typing definitions. It's working fine, but will it work fine in future if you're using in uh, using it in that way? Yeah, maybe yes, maybe no, but you must have in your mind that that those things can break in future. If you follow uh, the instructions by Microsoft in typings, you're fine. You will uh, eventually end in a deprecation notice. Oh, that will be deprecated and then you need to fix it. But those unsupported changes can change anytime and it will break your applications. Uh, parameterize your inputs. I saw uh, more than one component that is using XRM page extensively. So I need to pull few values from the um, form and they're using XRM.page. Please don't do it. Just uh, add few more properties that you will bind to some fields and use it as input uh, other than Get, uh, get, uh, get those values by XRM page. Please don't get the values from the page by XRM page. That's 
definitely unsupported, parameterize your inputs. Imagine that uh, the, your control is like function. It has few inputs and output, and you need to provide every single input to your component, and uh, you do that by uh, adding new properties, and that's the only w the right way to do it. So please do it that way. If you need to fetch anything other than your inputs, use Web API, fetch the data, make it uh, compact as much. So uh, specify only fields that you need to fetch and stuff like that. Explore the framework docs. There are dozens of things uh, exposed by the framework that people don't know. For example, the user settings, the most basic thing. So if I need to get uh, the date format, I can easily get it by the framework. I don't need to hack things around it. How can I get it? Uh, most of the things will be available in the future. There is an idea section in the community forums. There are, uh, that are great uh, resource when you need. Oh, there is a nice feature that I want to have in the PCF framework. Posted there, people from Microsoft are monitoring the forums frequently, and maybe that uh, they're pr prioritizing the tasks by the ideas in the community forums. So maybe your uh, idea will be uh, released really soon because it's really important for other guys if they upvote it or stuff like that. If you don't use unsupported things, it will pay off in future. That that's for sure because imagine you're using unsupported extensively and now there is a big update like the UCI update in the model driven apps and most of your unsupported changes will break. Imagine how many hours, hours will you spend to fix that? It's really ridiculous amount of hours that you need to spend on all your controls where you extensively used unsupported things. Please uh, follow the interface given by Microsoft uh, that is in typing uh, definitions. So if you have the stuff in IntelliSense, if you press that and you get a value, that's most likely the supported thing. If you can uh, see that there are more values from uh, debugger console in your browser, but it's not showing in your Visual Studio code, for example. Think twice before you use it because uh, maybe it will be changed in future and it will cause a really uh, big headaches to you because you will need to fix it by yourself. And I think that we came to the end. Thank you for joining me on this session. I hope I was more or less in time. Uh, and now we are open for questions. Are there any questions in the Q&A section? So I am uh, monitoring the Q&A section and for now there are not uh, questions. So I think you did a great job. And sorry once again that I said Poland instead of Croatia. <laughs> I always seem to mix up Thomas with Thomas oh, with, with you. I don't know why. Uh, so Maybe you, you look like a twin brother or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. I was I had Thomas in mind, but no worry. I know from now on I know it's Cro Croatia. <laughs> OK, so no, but we don't have any questions. Uh, I do have one question, though. You talked about you. You um, you said something about a PCF gallery or yeah. It, it, oh, we made a minute. I just OK. He just said an um, anonymous user said an interesting session. Okay, OK, no, the PCF gallery. I just wanted to say that indeed that is an, a gallery that can be used by both and uh, professional developers, IT pros, and eventually advanced citizen developers. So I don't know if you've seen the site. If you go to the site HTTPS uh, uh, and then slash slash uh, PCF.gallery, then you can use the, the components in your solutions. But no, there are not any other questions for now. Um, I do still have something to share, if you don't mind. Um, I will share my screen for one second. Um, if I so hopefully everyone can see my screen. So and, uh, so once again, thank you 
Ifan for uh, joining us. It was a very good session. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, appreciated it. Um, so for those who missed parts of the session, don't worry as this will be made available through our resource channels. You can find these channels on our website. Also be noted our next online event. Um, our next online event will be on the 16th of July 2020. Hopefully everyone can see the slide. So on the 16th of July 2020, we will be joined by Mr. Hong all the way from Malaysia, but we will use another time frame. So we will use like an, uh, we'll be uh, live at 14 o'clock, 14 uh, uh, zero zero GMT because of the time difference between um, uh, uh, yeah, Belgium and Malaysia. So now um, that will be uh, the next event. Also, uh, uh, we noticed that uh, that from uh, August we will probably um, revisit our format. So now it's like a live event, but we are looking at possibilities to make it a more interactive session. So we will probably make it a, a regular Teams event, but stay put for any announcements regarding this issue. I don't know if Ivan still have something to share with us. I'm waiting for questions. Okay. Are there any developers on call or, <laughs> or is it that great? I don't know really. <laughs> no, actually, no, I do, I do see a lot of compliments. Huh? I do see a lot of compliments, but actually there are no questions at the moment. So I, I still think you did a great job. Although I'm not a developer, <laughs> okay. I do I did understand what you were talking about. Or maybe I should yeah, say I'm not a developer maybe yet. Only the, <laughs> maybe only the, dev, uh, the developer pro dev part was the debugging part, but you can always pick up the interesting information from all the other slides because it's like talking in general about performance, how to make it more affordable for uh, users and stuff like that. So I think that most of the guys picked up something new. Uh, yeah. uh, maybe the experienced uh, PCF developers didn't hear uh, anything new, but I'm sorry if, if that's <laughs> the case, but. Yeah. Uh, but one thing is for sure to work with PCF or with a Power Apps component framework, you have to be a pro developer, correct? Yeah, sure. Yeah, as, as I saw, few guys tried to code the components, the very basic ones. Uh, and they managed to get it working, but for the actual components that you will uh, make, so the, as I said, a huge components that are using all the frameworks and all the complex logic there, of course, you, you will need to be a professional developer to yeah. understand how it's all bound around, but yeah. at the end, anybody can make a simple PCF control if they want to uh, understand understand how it's working in the background. Yeah, sure. that's for sure. Yeah, because when I talk about fundamental knowledge and I'm talking about things like uh, C sharp and uh, JavaScript, probably a little bit of .NET, I suppose. Those those other languages, I suppose that are in, uh, uh, you should uh, know something about. I do yeah, see a uh, question. Type yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, TypeScript is the, the language for the PCF uh, components. You can make them in JavaScript, but if you are coming from the .NET or C Sharp development, the most familiar way to you is to go TypeScript route because uh, it's more like the C Sharp code. You are more familiar with TypeScript than JavaScript. I face that with my own developers in the company. They are more used to TypeScript. They are not using still the TypeScript that much, but they understand the TypeScript more. If they are backend developers switching to the frontend development, TypeScript is the way to go. That's definitely. Okay. I also got another interesting question here in the Q&A. Uh, um, one user, Rick, asks, and, um, do you think a security specialist should always look at the code used to create the control? Uh, so, uh, I should say yes, but uh, I don't think that you will always have that security specialist because imagine that if you are working on a large project that has a tons of custom UI code, uh, the question is, 
the, if your security specialists can look uh, all the controls you made, I know you can have external APIs. Are they using the modern technologies to secure the client secrets? Are you allowing non-secured connections to come to your controls and stuff like that? Sure, the security uh, guy must check the controls, but the question is, do you have those security guys always available for you? For, for the basic controls, I don't think that uh, security specialists should look the control, but if you have the complex controls, uh, when you use the external APIs, yeah, security guy must check the code. Or at least you need to explain to, to him what are you doing inside the control. They're, they don't need to understand your code. They need to understand the story about your control in general. What are you using and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that was a nice question. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I think that it will be that will be it for now. Um, once again, if I thank you for making the time, I know that tomorrow you will not be available. You will be <laughs> on an, <laughs> you will be on an island somewhere. <laughs> uh, actually, I am already there for a week. Okay. So, so I so I have a mobile hotspot. I set everything up. Uh, it's I have a crazy setup at the moment just to make the presentations. I had a session yesterday at the community summit too, and I made it almost from the beach. So, yeah. Crazy yeah. things happen here. <laughs> yeah, I can completely understand. <laughs> also, once again, from our part, and, uh, congrats and, uh, with uh, with your renewed MVP status. Thank you very much. Yeah. And also, congrats uh, with uh, achieving the the MB six hundred for platform architect or solution architect yeah. and, uh, certification. I do know that it's a very hard exam. So, uh, congrats on that. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. It was yes. a really nice experience from the virtual point of the meetup. And I'm yeah. lately doing a lot of virtual events. So <laughs> I think it's everyone. interesting. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So once again, thank you, Ivan. And then, uh, I would say everyone, thanks for joining us. And uh, I would say until the next time. Bye bye. Bye guys and thank you for tuning in. <laughs>